welcome again for those people who weren't here before. Um, we are delighted that you're with us today. And you're in, you're in for an interesting conversation. Prof and I have been WhatsApping each other around, around um, this conversation. And I'm, I'm hoping he's reading what people are saying. Nicole's saying, I'm inspired by Professor Janssen and can't wait to spend time with him. And, and today it's gonna to feel like spending time, even if we're not in the same room. Uh, ben said, I'm a student of leadership development and I love the prof. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of Prof Janssen. I'm interested in developing as a leader. Thank you very much for all of you, for your spirit of generosity to share with us why you came. Please continue because it's helping us to get a, get a sense as to what our community are in, interested in. So um, this conversation today is about reimagining leadership development. Uh, we, I've, had, I've been having the privilege recently of having lots and lots of conversations with people about um, with leadership development, what your questions are. I just want to ask Ben, can you please keep an eye for me on the sound so that we can just keep, keep our mute going. Um, anyway, so I've had lots of conversations with people, uh, heads of leadership development, and then they tell me that they're not happy with the return on investment, that whatever they're doing at the moment isn't giving them the return on investment. And I'm not going to talk about what they're doing because that might sound critical. But what we, are, what we are, have the opportunity to do is to reimagine what might leadership development look like. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead Professor Janssen in a few, he's very brave, he's allowing me to ask questions and he's going to respond to those questions. And the first question I'm going to ask him, and then none of this is staged, we are doing this live as an example of, of reflective practice live. Um, so Prof, you have a lifetime of experiences of working with students of all ages. And you've been accompanying people on their learning journeys. But for the people on this call to give, get a different sense to you than just the man who's on stages and you know, write provocative articles, would you be willing to share with us your story, your leadership journey? And, the, and this is going to be a tough ask. I want you to share your story in five minutes from the day you were born to today, the 11th of May, 2021. Over to you, Prof. No, no, we can't hear you. You are muted. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Louise, and thank you for your leadership. And thank you to all of you for joining. When I hear people say, you know, such nice things, I, I'm very humbled, actually, because I don't think of myself in, in elevated terms. And, and it's not even trying to be humble. It's just a fact, you know, that one is shaped by so many uh, people who who made your life, uh, you know, exciting and uh, leaderful and, and so on. So, yeah, I, again, you know, I grew up, as, as many of you know, on the Cape Flats, born in Montague, parents moved down to uh, Port Elizabeth and uh, it settled in Cape Town and so on. And I had no sense <laughs> of myself as anything, let alone a leader, you know. I had a very strong sense of uh, um, my mother as a leader. Um, she was pretty much the matriarch in the home. My dad was pretty <laughs> quiet, humble, generous, uh, funny guy. But so I grew up in, in a home with very strong images of maternal leadership, but never had the sense of being a leader. In fact, um, a year or so ago, I spoke to, I met some primary school kids, we, uh, young people who went, adults who went to primary school with me in Stienberg. I said, uh, what was I like, you know, because I don't, people say you did this, that, and that. And they said, no, you're always a leader, but I wasn't aware of it. Um, until, of course, I, I, you know, went to church with uh, parents of evangelical church people, and you begin to play a role in leadership in Sunday school, you begin to play a role in leadership in your soccer uh, group, you begin to play leadership in, in, in youth uh, ministry and that kind of thing. And, and then you suddenly become aware of the fact that you're leading things, but, but not in any glorious grand sense, you were just taking charge, I suppose. 
and 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 I enjoyed leading. Um, I enjoyed leading at university, at school, and so on. Um, and uh, especially being a school teacher and leading a science department. Um, uh, Rob, you're, you, you, you're missing lots of bits of data. So we want to know, where did you go to school? Where did you go to university? Where oh, okay. You, you want, you want detail. Okay, want okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. Uh, you know, I, I'm so used to doing these radio interviews where you have like 30 seconds to say everything, you know. Uh, so this is a more generous uh, uh, screen. But yeah, so I went to uh, Sullivan Primary School um, uh, in the year that it opened, actually. Uh, in 63 and then um, uh, and all I remember about primary school is being beaten you know or chased or so on I don't have glorious views of loving teachers and all of that certainly not in primary school in high school I was very lucky at Stienberg High School to have uh, uh, really bad teachers but also really good teachers teachers who took an interest in you teachers who sort of I opened one of my report cards the other day where I was clearing out uh, boxes and trying to throw things away. There's a report card from my uh, biology teacher, Mrs. Akuji, and it's really interesting. I was standing nine, I think, and she's in the comment section at the bottom. She says, uh, uh, this is okay, but it's nothing near your potential. Now, you know, you sort of say to myself, my gosh, is that the, what they were thinking at the time? So I always had a sense, and you've seen this things I've written, uh, you know, in books and in in my columns of teachers who were there, even though the circumstances were awful in terms of resources and, you know, the, the violence and the politics, there were always teachers looking out for you and, and caring for you and pushing you a little harder, you know, towards the front of the, of the queue, so to speak. And so that had a huge influence on me. And then also in the church community, there were always people saying, how are things going at university? Hey, you know, we, we prayed for you last night. Now this, this stuff, has a huge influence on you. If not understood immediately, it's understood later in life. And the one thing that I remember, Louise, you're going to love this story, is my parents used to go to Port Elizabeth to a visit with family. And this family themselves were, so all the trauma, you know, they were uh, forcefully removed from Fairview where they lived to Salsonigal, Bethelsdorf. And I remember very clear, at 13 years old, playing soccer with my cousins outside in the street, and suddenly the door opens, and there's a whole lot of aunties coming out, you know, uh, uh, with my mother. And the one auntie came straight to me. She ignores everybody else. She comes straight to me in the street. And she says to me, Johnny, you know, my boy, we used to pray for you when you were still in your mother's womb. And I said, thank you very much. And I went on playing soccer. I tell you, to this day, it it, it's something that is so powerful in my memory of love and care and community that before I was born, there was this group of people looking out for you, you know, and uh, this is not so much about the spiritual lives of people and their prayer lives. That's something we can talk about. It's the fact that they cared before you were there that made a huge difference. And that's why I went into teaching eventually, because if you can demonstrate Teacher leadership. A lot of teachers, you know, we had a, in this, in this, in this, um, uh, while you sent us to the breakaway rooms, Louise, I was with, with two people, one of whom was a school secretary. And she kept saying, I'm just a humble school secretary. And I reminded her, I reminded Nicole that, you know, um, in the study we did of 30 primary school schools in the elite you know, southern suburbs uh, a year ago, two years ago. You know what I discovered? The most powerful presence, the most powerful person, the person that decides who gets into that school or not, okay, is actually the secretary. So we underplay the power, the authority that we have. You're not just Nicole, and I say this with all the love in my heart, you're not just a humble school secretary. You're actually a very powerful presence. Uh, and people's image of the school depends on what they see in you. Uh, and so on. And uh, that's my encouragement to all of you. Whatever you think your level or ranking is in your occupation or in society. And so I grew up, went to universities. There's a, it's a horrible Which year. One? Which one? University of the Western Cape. It's 1976. It's the worst year to go to university. Okay. <laughs> 1976. And I, I hear for the first time of a place called Southwestern Townships, you know, Soweto. And Nikki Morgan comes into our science uh, 
lab and he says, you know, we are declaring, uh, <laughs> we are declaring solidarity with the people in Soweto. And I put up my hand and said, where the hell is Soweto? <laughs> Of course, at that time, you know, nobody knew Soweto if you lived in the Cape. Um, and and that was the end of it, you know. And so at UWC, in a, in a place where most of the lectures were in Afrikaans, I, my mother tongue is English. I couldn't understand all of this stuff, you know. Oxygen in, in English is oxygen. In Afrikaans, it's sea stock. I couldn't, I, it took me years to make the connection. You know, which is easier when you talk about carbohydrates or quillidrata. So it was a rough year and I gave up, as you probably know. I stepped out and I said after my first year, this is too ridiculous. I failed the first year at UWC uh, because of the, the, the turbulence and all of that and my under preparation, to be honest. And, and so I dropped out and people took me back. Leaders in the community took me back. And my parent, my mother in particular, encouraged me to keep studying. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here with you today. My point simply is, whatever you think of yourself as a leader, others made it possible for you to lead. And never, ever forget that, okay? You're not great. It's others who made you, you know, do certain things. Got it. We're still interested in your story. So and you then, obviously dropped and out then, and then... Uh, yeah, and then I started to teach at Friedenberg, being, of course... Uh, and somebody who wanted to move out of the big city and teaching, you know, a sense of mission. So I applied to the R, <laughs> both in Beaufort West, um, the R Beaufort West and Friedenberg. Those days you had to choose three schools. They chose Friedenberg and what an incredible first experience as a teacher uh, in a school where the kids were my age because there was no primary school, a uh, high school for black kids. They went to work at Soldana Fisheries and those kinds of places. And then they came back when the high school opened, which is when I started to teach. And that was rough, <laughs> but the kids were incredible. Um, very poor, fishing village kids from, you know, Paternoster, all of these places coming by bus in the morning. And, and that helped me as a leader because there was nobody to lead uh, the science. Community, so I was suddenly leading, leading the the athletic teams, leading in, in the community, and then I moved back to Cape Town, taught in District Six, and oh my word, this is the last days the, the houses are being pulled down by P. W. Porter or whoever was the, the crook at the time, <clears throat> and the kids literally while I was teaching them, they looked out of the window at Trafalgar High School and they saw their flats being raised, the last of the flats. It was hard, hard, hard. And yet in that circumstance, I had some of the most amazing teachers, many from the youth, not the youth, the, uh, the uh, new unity movement, people like Annie Steenfeld and others. I mean, these weren't just teachers. These were, these were intellectuals. These were, you know, incredible leaders. So I, I was always in the shadow of a Sally Adams in physics or these people who inspired me to be a teacher leader. And then I decided, no, look, I, I, there's only so many ways you can teach the leadership of the firm, the, the life cycle of the firm. <laughs> and then you get really bored the 10th time around. And so I, I had the opportunity to apply for a scholarship that Bishop Tutu, in fact, managed uh, to study overseas, went to Cornell University, did a science master's there, and then to Stanford in California to do a, a PhD. And the more I studied, the more I realized, oh my word, I can do the next thing because I, I really didn't think I could do let alone become a professor. So you learned leadership and the, what I learned in the US was academic leadership, which is a different kind of leadership to school leadership or you know community-based leadership. I became very involved in activist projects. Uh, I, was, I led a team, by the way, that filled a plane, can you believe that, to leave from San Francisco to Southern Sudan uh, at the time. There was a huge war there. And we put medical supplies and everything on that plane. And so you, you learned leadership by doing leadership. You learned leadership by being amongst people who were leadership examples to you. You learned leadership in the trenches because those were difficult times, as you can imagine, back in South Africa and, and also abroad. And then I came back home in, in the 91. Uh, uh, eventually I had a job as a university professor. I, I, this is really interesting. I wouldn't advise this for anyone. I was never like a lecturer, senior lecturer, associate. They just gave me a full professor's job. Don't do that, okay? It's very dangerous. Um, uh, uh, but I suppose I saw something in the CV. And then I learned to lead academic departments, faculties, eventually um, a university. 
So my leadership role is always in education, but always with a sense of education and community. So let me just give you one more example, if you, if you don't mind. So when the, when the lockdown happened, the pandemic hit us, I, dis, I was doing a normal academic book and doing the theory chapter on institutional theory and all of that, all very nice stuff, all very fascinating for me anyway. But then I realized, what the hell are you doing? You're writing these heavy theoretical texts for the academic community of 100 people or 200 people. And the country is in lockdown. So I said, no, I gotta write books at the same time as I do these important academic works. And out of that came learning under lockdown. You know, and we, I mean, even yesterday I bought, Saturday, sorry, I bought a bunch of these books just to give it to schools uh, around wherever I go. So, uh, and this, and we just finished, by the way, teaching under lockdown. So that's also with a printer now that should come out uh, in a few months. And then I'm doing something with one of my postdocs called parent teaching under lockdown. You know, nobody that writes about this, but parents were thrust into the role of being more actively involved as teachers during the hard lockdown than before. My point simply is leadership for me isn't just academic in the narrow sense. It is also broadly social and educational. And so an academic leader who only writes for a small community of you know, disciplinarians, I think is not really living their full leadership potential by making your scholarship speak to the broader community. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay, but Prof, I'm still coming back. We, we're hearing a story here. So you kind of went from Cornell to Stanford to today. What happened? We want to know where did you work? What did you do? What, just quickly, and then we're going to get into the- Sure, sure. So, so when I came back from Stanford in 91, um, I had a job with an American firm to work with NGOs that were seen as working outside of the apartheid government. In other words, they were working like you do. In, in Symphonia. And so they gave me a lot of money and said, you've got to decide with your teams who gets this money from uh, these American-based firms that were funded, by the way, by USAID. And that's where I really got into the NGO. That's why I admire Symphonia. That's why I admire you so much because it brought me out of state you know, schooling and public universities into the NGO space. And I know for a fact then and now you close down the NGO space, this country collapses. I guarantee you that. Because there is a invisible leadership very often. The visible ones are the ones we know, like, you know, this amazing man, um, you know, Gift of the Givers, uh, uh, MTS, and so on and so forth. We know amazing people, like yourself, Luis Monterey. But there's a whole lot of people we don't know who just keep this country going. You know, there's people who lead in backyards with ECD, embryonic ECD structures, et cetera, et cetera. So I worked in that space and I provided two things with my teams. The one was what the Americans call technical assistance. So, it's, you know, uh, all kinds of consulting advice, training and so on and so forth. And, and, and the other was evaluation skills. So giving people the ability to make sense of impact. Does your NGO make an impact? And to this day, I'm involved in that. Right now, we're trying to set up uh, uh, early childhood centers attached to primary schools in Kutisville, in Stellenbosch, so that children get high quality ECD that takes them into grade one in a systematic way, instead of going to aftercare centers where they may or may not learn anything, and then eating grade one, not being able to write their names. So, 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 uh, and then, of course, as I said, I transitioned from that into formal University at UDW, the University of Devon West, <laughs> that was that was a crime scene at the time <laughs> because Nelson Mandela had to send out uh, investigation into that place. The place was basically being, you know, uh, stripped apart by pseudo political activists at the time, including Adam Abu, by the way. You might remember I pressed him on that uh, uh, and and others. And then from there, from UDW um, to the University of Pretoria as a dean to uh, three states vice chancellor and in between playing the role of an administrator that's where a minister appoints you to head up a university that had basically become totally dysfunctional well, one was DUT in Durban and the other was MUT in Mangasutu also in, in Umlazi Durban so so yeah so sadly you know much of my 
work with schools has always been on the side and uh, and and helping school principals etc and but my main work has only been in in university education okay thank you prof i wanted right. to kind of wanted you to just do that little sure, now, sure. a little while ago you and i were on a call together and we had santiago rincon galardo on this call and i'm telling this story because we have 65 people, many of them involved in leadership development in large corporates. And I think this guy, even though he talks about educate, he talks about learning in schools, he's got a point. And the point that he makes, and I'm telling the story for everybody's benefit who went on that call, and Professor, you might remember, he said um, that the problem, one of the problems that we have in schools is that children are not learning because they are not seeing adults learn. They see adults teach, but they don't see adults learning. So I decided that day that I'm not going to be, I'm not, I'm just going to stop trying to put myself in a lecture or teaching or whatever. I'm going to show up as a lead learner. And every time I show up in a room, I'm going to learn. I'm there. That's my intention. So today, even though I'm the host, I'm also the lead learner. But I know from what I've discovered with about you over the last many years, is that you also show up as a lead learner. So that's the contract. Professor Janssen and I are here today to learn. We, we specifically didn't, didn't design the session as a you know, packaged event. We, we are here and we're gonna learn in the moment. Now, we are also gonna to talk today about, we, the, the, the topic for our conversation today is reimagining leadership development. And the one thing that Prof. Janssen and I share is a, is a belief that we have to rethink how we go about developing leaders. And we're going to touch on some of those aspects. Now, many of you will know that in um, Symphonia and through Partners Possibility, we think that 70-20-10 uh, is the magic formula. 70% of our learning happens from taking our own experience seriously from, from being in the trenches. And, and we can talk a little bit about with Professor Janssen about that, because I think he's been, in my experience, a model in that aspect. 20% is the social learning, 10% is the what happens in the classroom. So today we're going to talk about the 70 and the 10, but I want to start with the 70%, because my experience is that that's the, the greatest opportunity for us to learn is when we take our own experience seriously. Now, um, the, 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 the terminology that I love to, that, that kind of made a big difference in my doctorate study was this idea of autoethnography. And it's when we write reflectively to make sense of our experience. Now, Prof, um, you know how I've been touched by knowledge in the blood because my story about knowledge in the blood might not be your story. My story about knowledge in the blood is it was an experience for you to make sense of your own experience of what had happened in Pretoria. And that sense making, I would think, and you need to tell us whether, whether that's right, was probably one of the most powerful um, learning and leadership development experiences for yourself. Was one, once you made sense of what happened in Pretoria, and it kind of set you up for success at, at the free state. So tell us a little bit about that. Do you agree? Is that your memory? Am I, have, am I imagining something that's not there? That idea of taking your own experience seriously, writing about it, writing yeah. in order to discover that whole process. No, you're absolutely correct. You know, knowledge in the blood was very transformative for me because I came to the University of Pretoria, you know, I was molded politically at least in the black consciousness movement. So that's how I thought, you know, and I thought of white people as a problem <laughs> that needed to be solved. I mean, it sounds ridiculous today, but uh, at the time I can assure you, uh, you know, I, I had a sense of my righteousness and, 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 you know, the wrong things of our past and, and therefore going to the University of Pretoria, encouraged by, by a very open-minded, Afrikaans guy called Johan van Seyl, who became the head of Sundam eventually. And Chobani Mangani, who was advising him, who's become a mentor to me ever since. But I went in with a very strong sense of me and my role as a leader, and I'm going to turn things around and take this basis institution by the scruff of the neck, you know, and turn it upside down. Arrogant as that was, that was the truth, you know. 
The problem is when you lead with an open heart, you can't be unaffected by the people around you. So the people around me at the time were not black students. There was very few black students, certainly in education. Um, at the time, it was mainly white and mainly Afrikaans students. And the more I let them, the more, you know, I, I, I saw them not as white students, but as my own students. The longer I let them, I saw them not as other people's children, but as my own children. Now you can't use that language um, at Vitsu UCT. You know, people will get quite offended. But it's perfectly okay in these Starke Afrikaans universities because, you know, that, that the connection between the teacher and the, and the learner is very real in that particular culture. So it was okay for me. I could say, even to this day, I could say to an Afrikaans undergraduate student, make them call me, you know, and they would come and understand that not as being, you know, patronizing or, or anything, but as, you know, the only, it may grow or something like that. And the more I got into their homes, the more I got into their churches, the more I got onto Loftus, which to this day, I'm a blue bull, as you know, the more I said, but this may mean so it's my people, you know. But with that, I had to deal with my ghosts. I had to deal with my, you know, attitudes about others, about them. I had to deal with my presumptions. I remember a night in, when I was writing Knowledge of the Blood, one night it was back at, at my old university at Stanford, and it was two or three in the morning that I was writing this. And I tell you, um, Louisa cried like a baby then, because I just realized how wrong I was. I just realized how broken I was. I just realized, because I had met my people, you know, that is why I, I get when I'm in black company and people sort of say, you know, how people, I remember the, the vice chancellor of a nearby university, I won't mention her name. Uh, she came to me and sort of said, you know, uh, you know, why are you talking about them? You must talk, you must protect our people. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Our people is all my people. It's not, you know, that she's obviously still struggling with stuff, as you can imagine. But knowledge in the blood forced me to look in the mirror and to see myself. And I hope that that made me a better leader. I hope that made me a more empathetic leader. But it certainly took me, and this is the point I want to share with you, it took me from seeing leadership as a toolbox techniques, strategies, you know, all of that stuff, to leadership as emotional connection, to leadership as spiritual connection, to leadership as you may. I've got a PhD student at the moment, Penny Elston, she's doing this amazing thesis on nearness in leadership, which is one of the things that I've been working on in the back I've made. So who are those principles who approach the people they are privileged to lead, not from the point of view of HR, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and all of that, and performance management and so on, but approach them from the perspective of being mutually vulnerable and in need of each other and in need of leadership. And that's, you could have, in a nutshell, that's what Knowledge in the Blood did. I read a book. In 2009, as you know, uh, Knowledge in the Blood, for everybody on the call, if you've not read that book, I, um, last year, I, did, I went back on my, my WhatsApp messages prof with Professor Janssen and I read a message I sent him last year in October. I said, I've just finished rereading Knowledge in the Blood and I now remember why I was so touched when I first read it in July 2009. This must be required reading for every educator at every school and university and for all those committed to a more just and equitable South Africa. Now, what that book did for me is it connected me with your humanity. So, so Prof, I, you know, I, I sometimes say to people, I have a love-hate relationship with Prof. Sometimes he's too full of himself and is at the front of the room. But I've read his book and I know the man behind all of the facade. And I love that man. So it made my relationship with you was significantly impacted by reading your vulnerable story, but my sense is that your relationship with yourself was completely transformed by that process of sense-making. Now, again, for those people who have not been on these calls before, many years ago or a few years ago, there was a tweet. Um, Professor Janssen had just published something and uh, someone tweeted and I think we thought it was so significant. She said to him, how do you get to, how do you get time to run a university and write? And your response at the time was, how can you run a university and not write? 
so that my my story about your leadership journey is that writing reflectively about your own experience has been a really important part and i personally think that the world will be a better place if more leaders did that and your commitment to go back to Stanford every few years to go and make sense of your experience and write and just talk a little bit about that as a, as a leadership development methodology for senior leaders of your kind of stature. Yeah, uh, you know, um, your perceptions about leadership have always sort of really impressed me because the, you see beyond the immediate. And, and when you lead in the crucible, of South African in higher education or South African education generally, it's tiring, it's exhausting. You know, it is, you are constantly giving of yourself. I mean, I got up early this morning to talk, to advise, to counsel a, uh, you know, for the sake of the context, you know, a young white woman academic at Forte University who wants to know how do I become a leader in my profession in sports science? How do I become, you know, and I love doing that. I absolutely love doing that. But you, you, you constantly give and give and give and give and give. And you're not going to survive as a leader. And that includes you, Louise, because you give a lot. If you don't take time out and, and just replenish, you know, and rebuild in order to continue giving of yourself. And so going to Stanford for me, I would go nuts in South Africa because I have, I mean, this might sound terrible, but I would go nuts in South Africa because I don't have a lot of people I can talk to at a deep level besides yourself and Adam and others about my work. I can't. And so when I go there, I go for 10 months or so. Normally people are there support me so because it's extremely expensive, especially on the West Coast. And, um, and I come back and I'm feed and fly and then <laughs> full of energy and I've shared ideas and I've tested ideas. But I also do a reckoning with myself. So one of the things I think, because you know you're in another time zone, nine, eight or nine hours, ten hours behind depending on the season. I spend a lot of time early in the morning, three o'clock, four o'clock, and I just think to myself, you know, what are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? Where can you improve as a leader? Where can you be softer? Where do you need to check yourself? Because I'd like to believe that I've gotten things right in my early 60s, but it's not true. You actually continue to make mistakes. And that's why your point is so important. If you're not constantly open to learning and open to being rectified. So sometimes I would make an argument in public and sound convincing, but what people don't see is when I get home at night, I actually go and say, maybe you were wrong. Maybe you got that wrong. And then I call the person and apologize. Nobody knows about it, you know. Um, and that for me is the constant learning. And the, what the Stanford thing does for me, it's a long way to get there. It's much easier getting to New York, by the way. But that extra six hours kills you to the West Coast. And, but what it does for me is it gives me a chance to recharge, but also to rethink my leadership. So I'm with you. I think, I, you know, my answer is... is um, how can you lead anything and not write and not create opportunities to make sense? Now, not everybody is going to write. Some of us are going to make sense of our own experience in the presence of, you get to do this today in the presence of 62 people. So I'm going to put some questions to you that is, you're going to have to think about a bit. Now, our theory listen, is listen, that, can I Can I just interrupt you quickly? You said something that was life-changing for me the other day. Um, and I just, you might have forgotten, but it's, it's really important that this audience hears this. You know, I, 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 I have a great love for Adam Abim, and I've worked with him when he was a reckless political activist, and I've worked with him when he was a vice chancellor. But, and you made the point that I am actually going to share with him, because I call him every week. And that was one of the reasons Adam Land might have landed in trouble at SOAS, at the University of London, is he went straight from this to another heavy, heavy job. And your point to me was, maybe he needed just to take a break, just to recharge, just to find himself. Because he said to me, that question came at the end of a tiring day, and he wasn't thinking, you know? And look at the trouble it caused, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so 
I, I'm grateful to you for mentioning that point, that perhaps it's just because running bits, I can tell you, is not like running the local spa in Stellenbosch. I can assure you that it is a hectic political environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I think there's something about two, three, four months. You said, you told me that I needed to take a year out. There's yeah. no taking time out after, during this transition period is critical. And when we don't, we, we run ourselves ragged. So, so again, we're going to have to ha hold each other accountable about this. But Prof, I want to, I want to ask you some tough question or a few tough questions, just, and it comes from a place of deep admiration and love. Um, but I, my sense is that if you had to make sense of these questions in our presence, so you can imagine that you've got 66 people who are hanging off your every word, who are looking at you with soft eyes and, and keen to, to see your brain go all over the place. Um, because I, wanna, I want you to just think about why do you do this kind of stuff? So my experience of you is that you have been uh, incredibly generous and I'm going to mention some examples of generosity in a minute and I do think some of that's coming from your your mother but I'm going to ask you about specific examples and then you can talk to us about why why what what is it that led to that because I think there's nothing more more um, attractive than generosity on you and I both on Twitter and I often see you know there are people on Twitter who are who haven't got a generous bone in their bodies and then there are other people who are so generous in terms of sharing and amplifying and getting, and it's just, it's unbelievable for me how this comes out in Twitter. Anyway, so we'll talk about your generosity, but I'm going to do that later. I, I have a deep admiration for your willingness to tackle stuff. So you stick your neck out. The rest of us might kind of go, oh my goodness, this is, you know, what's going to happen? How is whoever going to respond to this? You go, mm -mm, this is something that needs a tracing. So I want to give you some examples, and then I want you to say, what was it about that moment that made you act? And why did you act? Because not all people will act. So one was the example where, um, I can't remember how it happened. I think we sent you a tweet or a message or a, we kind of made you aware of what was going on in Lavender Hill and Hillwood Primary. And then you didn't just, you didn't just listen to our story and left it. You wrote a, a column in the Times about um, about that what was going on in in Lavender Hill, and um, and as a result of your column, all sorts of things happened. The Western Cape Education Department suddenly took action. Um, there was just a whole bunch of things that none of us could we couldn't make it happen, but your column made it happen. Now I'm sure you also got in trouble. I'm sure there was some kind of how dare you say these things. But in that moment, why did you decide to write that provocative, pick your head out column? What's that about? Well, you know, the column every Thursday is 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 an opportunity to. Uh, I see it as a, as as you know myself as a public nuisance, by which I mean uh, raising issues that you got a platform. One of the things about a leader is you got a platform. Use it for the public good. Don't use it to advance yourself. Don't use it to dress up and make yourself look pretty. Uh, and, and, and I won't get to spend on that. But use your platform to draw attention because I won't always have this platform. I didn't always have this platform. Now I have this platform. And so if I can write about the Lambdale issue and see the WCD rushing to the scene and see uh, big donors or small donors rushing to the scene, it is a fantastic way of energizing people to do something about the problem. You know, and so that's what motivates me. I, you know, I grew up there. I know the people there. I've had friends there. I played soccer there. <laughs> Probably one or two golfers. I don't know. But I was, it, it's part of my retreat community. But I don't just do it because it's there and familiar to me. I do it because there's an issue. I mean, I got a student there, and I just want to tell you, Samantha Williams, you know, she got an LLB cum laude, and, and she lives in Lavender with a single parent. Her mother works at Dame. She can't go out at night, okay, for fear of being struck by a bullet. I have to draw attention to these things in order to make, you know, so it's, it's a platform for bringing people together. That's why I write it. Okay, so thank you. That's helpful. But, but you, you've got a 
provocative. So, so I want to just maybe not people on this call know this, but um, last week we had a, a conversation with Professor Shabir Madi about the vaccination issue. Not many people showed up. I'm quite interested in around why that was. But anyway, so, so and he said quite a few things to us that made us realize that, oh my goodness, this requires some activism. And I was kind of, oh, I'm going to, you know, take some, you didn't wait a minute. You didn't breathe. You just went, okay, I'm going to use my column. I'm going to write this article. And then you wrote the article and that was published last week. And then um, yesterday there was a very strongly worded response to your, your article and you weren't, you it wasn't an, the person who wrote the article wasn't nice about being nice about you at all so do you sometimes worry about how do you respond when you get that when you read that you know Jonathan Janssen did that and the other how did that land for you do you does that affect you at all or do you are you no talking? no it doesn't affect me at all uh, and the the so 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 there's two things the the one and, and again I, I have to reference my mother she taught me at a very young age if what you see uh, is what you see, you've got to say what you saw and not worry about the consequences. And that, that was deeply embedded in me. The second thing I want to say, and, and you would know, uh, since we know each other a long time now, that nothing upsets me more when people introduce me, including yourself, and you'd say, oh, we've got Professor Johnson here, as we know, he's provocative. You know, I don't actually think I'm provocative. And the reason I don't think I'm provocative is because my intellectual growing up was around people who said things as they saw it. Imagine growing up uh, with one of my great heroes who politically we differed like hugely, you know, educationally we differed hugely. His notion of, you know, the synthesis of the language of the African languages is total nonsense as far as I'm concerned. But I would walk a mile uh, on hot coal for Neville Alexander because he spoke what he believed to be true and ended up, as you know, in Palsmo. Um, but in the US, what was very interesting to me at the time, it's a bit different now after this Trump fiasco, you know. But you know, I used to see coming out of apartheid South Africa, people like Sam Donaldson from ABC, they get up in the White House and say, Mr. President, you're lying to the people about Nicaragua. And I say, oh my word, you can do that. So, so I also grew up in environments inside and outside the country where you wouldn't regard, you know what, why people sort of say that I'm provocative is because everybody else is scared to say what they think, okay? So if there was a hundred other people who would also just stick their necks out and, and say what they say, Fortunately, there's a few. I'm not alone. Did you see Justice Malala's uh, reflections uh, on the passing of the Zulu king who's Velatini? Oh my word. I mean, that is provocative. <laughs> that can get you killed, you know. So thanks to Justice Malala, thanks to, um, it wasn't Justice, it was the, the City Press guy, editor. Um, we have some fetal effigy. I mean, she's been in trouble often, you know, for just speaking her mind. But we need more people. We need more people not to, to sort of say, you cannot, 27 years later, still have 2,000 schools in the Eastern Cape with pit latrines. Man, that is wrong on so many levels. Now, if you can't say that, then I don't know what a democracy is. So there's no doubt that I often feel so grateful that you saying things because as a white person I'm a bit careful about what I say because it's definitely going to be called you know a lot of what I a lot of what you say if a white person had to say that it would be called racism so thank good, goodness that you can say some of the stuff that you're saying so I want to um, open up this, the, the conversation to other people but before I do that I want to quickly talk about our leadership in crisis um, leadership at a time of crisis series that we've done mm. so just in for everybody um and I, I don't think I've told Professor Janssen this, so let me do that in the spirit of complete authenticity. When he sent me a note earlier this year and said, why don't we do this leadership in Christ thing? I felt like I'd gone, I'd died and gone to heaven. The thought that Prof Janssen would do that with us was just like, oh, it just completely blew my mind. But it's been interesting for me that um, the very well-known names, so Prof, Prof Thule, Prof. Adam Habib, Prof. Mampela Mampela, got lots of people coming. 
And then we had Archbishop Mahoba, and not many people signed up for him. And Professor Mali, not many people signed up for him. So I'm kind of curious around that. But in the spirit of being a lead learner, I'm curious to hear from you. Um, what did you learn from those conversations? What, what was your takeaway from you know, those five conversations we've had so far? And we're hoping to have many more. But part of this purpose of having this conversation is also to hear from the people on this call who would you like Prof. Janssen to interview and what would you what would you like to learn from those people? But Prof, from your perspective, can you remember those five conversations? Sure. So, you know what's interesting, Louis, is, is I don't actually remember much of what they said, but I remember a lot of who, about who they were and how they presented themselves. So I'll tell you a leadership lesson, which I hope the, our audience would find helpful uh, from each of them, from Thule. A modern seller, my colleague at Salem Bosch, I learned about grace in leadership. She's completely unflappable, you know. She has had huge criticism, as you know, particularly from the ANC uh, 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 operatives, uh, about everything in her personal life, her finances, uh, you know, all of that nonsense. And Tuli teaches me that what I learned from Tuli is how to be gracious in your leadership. She is completely level-headed, completely, un, as I said, unflappable. That is something I need to work on, you know, how to how to be gracious in leadership all the time. From uh, from Ampele Rampele, you know, because I know her and I know her, her history, I have learned a lot about the resilience. Here's a woman has been banned back and forth, you know, who's, um, you know, and she becomes you know, the Vice Chancellor of UCT is director of the World Bank, a, a prominent figure, and nothing, nothing takes her down. You know, the, the fiasco around uh, entree into political, you know, the party leadership. She's still resilient, eh? And, and I tell you, uh, if somebody has gone through so much uh, in her life and still stands, you know, and at the end of the day, it's a beautiful word in the Bible about that. Having done everything, just stand, you know, just stand. And she teaches me that resilience. From the Archbishop, you know, I uh, 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 I learned the value of truth. You know, people often don't, because he's not, you know, he's not charismatic like Archbishop Tutu was, you know. He's, he's not, he doesn't come with huge charisma. He's just like there, this young, handsome man from Limpopo. But he speaks the truth. When there's a crisis, people don't read it. I read these missiles on a Sunday morning. And it's about being the truth about the pandemic, the truth about corruption, the truth about in a very quiet way, like Tuli in many ways. Um, truth. With Shabir, whom I've now known quite intensely over the past uh, year and a half or so, um, and he's become a good friend, I, uh, I learned independence. People don't know how he was ignored, shoved around, uh, you know, and so on, because he had an independent view from other people who I also admire, like Lady Gray and Slim Karim and Quarisha and so on. But he's independent in his thinking. You cannot, and one of South Africa's biggest problems, and this is important for leaders and potential leaders to hear, is we only function well in crowds. And for me, the mark of a good leader is that when everybody deserts you, everybody has there, you stand on the truth you know. And his independence, based on his knowledge of science, is something that I took away big time. And then with, with Adam, I, I learned a really important lesson. When we interviewed Adam, you remember this, Louis, things were going well. He could compare himself favorably to Max Price, from the Fees Must Fall period, he, he, he did a good job at bits in my view, etc., etc. And then the storm hit him, big time. And you know, as I said, I've known him for most of my working life. And I've never seen Adam down. I've never seen Adam struggle. It was a huge thing. Because the whole world now knows about you and your struggles with, you know. And from Adam, I've learned a very valuable lesson. Never be complacent. Never gloat. Never be complacent. Because it could be going well the one moment, and then the next moment, you could be struggling. And so keep your feet on the ground. Be humble as a leader. And always understand. And this is, the, this is what 
most leaders who are out there, especially men, forget. We actually all have feet of clay. Um, I've just realized that, um, again, not, not, people might not know the story. So we interviewed, well, Professor Janssen interviewed Adam. It was beautiful because it was this clearly from their Durban days, they've been on a journey. I think we were all, I'm curious to know whether anybody on this call listened to that call conversation, but it was just, I was so inspired. And, and Adam did the same as you. He wrote a book about his experience with Feed Must Fall. So I immediately downloaded the book and I read the book and I was so inspired. And then the, hit, the storm hit. But again, Prop, you didn't just sit back. You stood up. You said, this is not right. You and Tuli and a few other academics mm. supported Adam. And then, and, and he sent me a note saying, please, can you send me the recording? Because I want to give this to, to our chair. And I, you know, my fantasy is that maybe that recording contributed to the decision. It kind of helped make sense prevail. But you know, if I think back of my, my leadership, my moments of leadership in the last few months, that was one of them. It was the, you know, it was the whole story. When I told my family, and on sun, Sunday at lunch, I told my family the story. I said, Adam has just been reinstated, and Professor Janssen and I have been talking, and we think they were truly inspired. And but it was making the most of that kind of human connection that we felt on the call and then and then then you took it further you didn't just let them fire him which was it was heading that way they were going to just fire him it would have been the simplest decision for the board of SOAS just to you know fall victim to the loudest noise from some students and from some union members but the majority of the academics backed him up and I think the majority of the board also but it would have been so convenient just to make the problem go away and take this newbie from Africa <laughs> and put him in the streets. And, um, and we thought it was important, you know, to, to make them aware of the fact that while you could have done that differently, this is not a, a fireable offense at all, you know? And, and again, it goes to who the person is. Now you got to know Adam to know that, you know, he was called a coolie uh, in his, Days. He was called all sorts of offensive names. He struggled against racism, uh, uh, you know, in his growing up in Maritzburg, in Durban, in Cape Town, when he was here, and so on and so forth. So you have to judge the person, not just on the basis of one moment in time in which, and I told him up front, I said, you probably shouldn't have used the word because of the, the, the year we're in, you know. Uh, there were books written with the N-word fully spelt out by, by, or the K-word in our context. Um, Mark Matabani's books, for example. But times have changed, you know, and therefore you have to be sensitive to that. And as, as I said earlier, he recognized that uh, as the end of a long day and being tired and all of that. You judge the man as a leader or the woman as a leader in terms of their whole corpus and not simply one moment of weakness and so it was important to say that to the board and to say that to people in the UK in particular which we did. So, so I want to say from my side thank you for for that very intimate conversation because it gave me a sense of both you and him of iconic leaders and it, it gave me a different sense of both of you so when that article you know when the storm hit I had such a different story about Adam than the story that I had about him when I just saw him mm. with kind of public persona sure so I'm going to make a pitch to everybody on this call that when Professor Janssen interviews someone when he gets them to say yes to me show up you don't want to miss out because your life will be changed I mean that was a life-changing opportunity for me now, there was a question here from Grant Kelly. Now, this is something that Grant and I both have a deep passion for. And he says, can you share your thoughts on what a suitable leadership development agenda for South Africa should prioritize and how that might differ from the current leadership development agenda? Now, I don't know how tuned in you are about, you know, what goes on in the, under the, 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 the umbrella of leadership development at the moment in this country. But I just, Grant's question made me wonder, 
Um, in your in Knowledge in the Blood, you talked about a post-conflict pedagogy. And I'm wondering to what extent, if you were given, if you were the head of a leadership development institute and you had to take all these leaders and prepare them for the future, and what would you, what would you teach? Three things, actually. Um, the, the one thing that we all do, but not well enough in our leadership models, is to train people in the technical dimensions of leadership. And, and I don't want to underestimate that because I can assure you, certainly in universities and I suspect in schools as well, we don't teach people how to be competent. You know, competence is something we sneer at, you know, particularly since uh, the days of Jacob Zuma. You know, anybody can become president or leader of the DA or whatever the case may be. And that's a dangerous thing to do. And so for me, being a leader does mean uh, being able to do things. So when I'm a leader of a university, I, I surround myself with very smart people, uh, but I know what I know and I know where else to, to go for that. But I must be able to ask the right questions for internal audits, because if I don't know what that's about, I could drown my organization. I need to ask the right questions about HR and, 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 and everything that goes with that. I need to know what King says, King Four says about Legion. The technical aspects of leadership is important. Competence matters, okay, uh, uh, et cetera. The second thing is you have to teach people uh, uh, a sense of politics. Um, I don't care, development is about politics. You would know this, Louise. Your ability to engage with political figures, your ability to engage, and I don't mean politics as in party politics. I mean, politics and understanding how power works and how influence works. That's what politics means to me. And if you don't have a sense of that, you will get bamboozled, you know, uh, by, um, uh, by uh, very powerful, uh, often men in different kinds of organizations. So you have to have a sense of politics. The people who find their way around political minefields are the people who are normally very successful in, in leadership. And the third thing, and this is what we don't teach, and this is a big thing to me, is to teach people the social aspects of leadership, by which I mean the emotional competences that we need, the spiritual competences that we need, the, the understanding of how humans think and, and work and, 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 and fear and love uh, and so on. And there's this whole aspect of emotional, you know, knowing when to speak and when to shut up knowing when to challenge and when to withdraw. Those are emotional competencies that I think are so important if you're going to be successful in your leadership. We do the technical well. Now and again, we do a bit of political. We are completely silent on this third dimension of leadership, which I think uh, in response to Grant is so important if you're going to be, you know, the way I worked when I go out into schools, the way I worked in Plutus well, is completely different from the way I work in um, a Newland school. It's completely different from how I worked in Kailicha, where I might have understand the first language. And that sex uh, has to do with the emotional connect. The, and uh, connect. So if you just think back to our friend, um, who wrote David Addison, who wrote that response to, to the vaccines. The easiest thing for me to do, the easiest thing for me to do is to write a response to you and, and knock him down point by point. It would also be the stupidest thing to do, okay? Because, first of all, you draw attention to this article, but secondly, it shows that you are fearful. It shows that you are vulnerable. It shows that you are oversensitive, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. Just be quiet and just keep on doing what you think is the right thing to do. There's no training manual on that, and there should be. But, so, you know, in the old days, we used to call those things soft skills. I think they're essential. They're very hard, and very hard. <laughs> and they're very hard, so they're definitely not soft. We need to get rid of that one. I do want to get to Mary's question. Mary is from Salzburg um, Global Seminars, which is just the most amazing organization. But I'm going to get to Mary's question. But I want to just, I have another, I think one of the points that, that Grant uh, is making, and, and um, I would agree with him, is that if you want to be a leader in South Africa, you need a, there's a, there's a fourth piece of the curriculum that really needs, is about, firstly, if you're white, 
deal, you know, what does that mean in this country? If you're black, what does that mean in this country? Because there is something about a cultural awareness that certainly many white people in my community are completely oblivious to. And if they're going to lead in this country, surely social justice has to be a priority. Talk to us about social justice and how do we get more people to make a commitment to social justice? Because it's so easy to just focus on shareholder wealth. Yeah, you know, I, I, you're right. Um, for me, the, let me just go to the heart of your question, because you, you started off there, and then I think you, you scrummed away, as they say in, in the rugby. Um, and that is racial knowledge. Okay, now as much as I believe race is a myth, as much as I believe it's a social construct, all of that is true. But there is a particular kind of racial knowledge, which we don't teach uh, uh, young people or older people for that matter. And it's time for us to face up to it and it should be in the curriculum. And that I would put under what I call the political, right? So watch, I watch people very care carefully and see how they engage in the public space. So I watch how Max Dupree engages in the public space compared to Pierre de Foss. So Pierre de Foss is, got a completely different approach compared to Milani Vavut, compared to, you know. So I, and one of the big things that makes a difference, especially for my white brothers and sisters, is a sense of humility. When you go in with a sense that, you know, the past is behind us, we did nothing wrong, let's just get on with the flow, you will be a danger to yourself, actually, you know. But if you go in with a sense, so the way to deal with social justice is, is for me to be aware of it as a, we didn't get into this mess overnight. We got into this mess over three and a half centuries. But I want to say this about social justice because it's been occupying my mind after a long day seminar with Tuli, Modern Seller and Evan Scadula. Um, I think we must move away from the notion of social justice as legal prescripts. And we should move towards a notion of social justice as something that is felt. I need to feel social justice in my life as opposed to knowing about it in the constitution. And people don't feel a sense of connection to our wonderful you know, documents about rights and responsibilities and all of it. They don't feel it, you know. Um, if you stand in a Sasa line for six hours, you don't feel social justice. You feel angry, you feel disappointed, you know. So so for me is what what are the correlates of a social justice in which people feel? I don't you know, one of my most one of my favorite Zapira cartoons of all time uh, is one, I don't know if you remember this from the early 90s. Uh, the middle mountains after democracy. There's a woman on her uh, on her knees uh, with soap and water washing her clothes, and there's a shack a set of shacks behind them, and the husband is sitting on a chair reading the newspaper. <laughs> and you can see this woman. I mean, talk about social justice. I mean, there's nothing on it, you know. And he reads the headlines to his wife, who's scrubbing. The, the clothes on a rock. And he says to her, you'd be happy to know the economic fundamentals are in place. <laughs> That's our problem. That's our problem. Is that social justice is sort of given to us as indicators, you know, of economic, uh, which only benefits, as you said, the shareholders, but it doesn't feel. And so one of the things that really troubles me is when I go into within 15, 20 minutes of driving from a school with, you know, Tartan Track Hockey Field to a school with a public I can't handle that, you know? Um, and, and it's because the social justice isn't felt. It's talked about, it's in the law, it's in policy, but it isn't felt. Mm. But that, uh, from, um, you know, so with Fondance Possibility, we've worked with 1,000, 400 and something principals and every single time I'm I visited one of those schools I mean that that's what we do need to spend more time being confronted with this stuff. We, we, someone said a while ago you know I said to the guy how's it going to be 
involved in problems. But he says, Louise, my heart is being, being broken every day. And I went home going, yes, that's how we're going to, yeah, you know, it's like we have to have our hearts broken because if our hearts are not broken, we can easily sit in our corporate offices thinking we, everything's fine and it isn't mm. fine. It, just, mm. oh, it is not fine. So we've come to the end. We, we're getting towards the end. I still want to ask Mary's question because I think Mary's question has something to do with something I just want to acknowledge in you. So, and then I want to invite anybody, if, any, if anybody else wants to acknowledge Professor Janssen. I, I say to people when, when, we, when we share our gratitude and appreciation, we, it's, like, it's like that extra bit of armor. So we, we want Professor Janssen to continue to, to be the change leader he is. And he doesn't need our appreciation, but our appreciation will bolster him and, and keep him going for a bit. So please don't hold back anybody. Um, so I want to start. So um, I have experienced you and literally I, could, I can track it back to the first time I met you at that um, airport hotel in, 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 at OR Tambo. And then every time after that, when we've come to you with a request, and sometimes our requests have been demanding, uh, you have just, you have been unbelievably generous and, and your spirit of generosity. So I do think that's part of the answer is for, for, for leaders to be humble, as you said earlier, but also generous. So, so I can talk the whole day about your generosity, which I'm not going to do because that will be very embarrassing for you. But I just want to acknowledge, I think that's something to do with this question. So, so this is Mary. So Mary works for Salzburg Global um, Seminars, which I don't know whether you know, Professor, it's just the most amazing organization. I mean, one day when I grow up, I'm going to have something to do with them. So she says, I help run a senior leadership program focused on enabling new leap in col collaborative leadership for health. Any reflections on how leaders can work better together for systems change? moving away from siloed vertical leadership. What, what's your kind of response to how do we get people to work together across boundaries? Um, that's, the, that's the leadership challenge of our time, I think. It is, and especially with the pandemic. Uh, as you know, I've, I've sort of gone public a few times saying, you're not gonna solve this problem only with epidemiologists. You're gonna need cultural anthropologists, you're gonna need sociologists, you're gonna need economists. Uh, you know, to work together to figure out how to solve this problem, because to talk about social distancing as a health problem in a shack is like ridiculous. We know that, okay? So, so but that's true for other aspects of life as well. Obviously, the first uh, attempt is persuasion. The first attempt is to say to the people in, in Mary's, uh, I'm certainly looking forward to Googling Salzburg, global seminars, but is to, to say we have a common interest here and there are efficiencies that can be gained when we work together as opposed to all of us trying to do separate or different or similar things. Uh, the first issue is persuasion. The other is, of course, a crisis. There's nothing like a crisis to bring people to their senses, you know, that we need to, to work together. And so I would pose the problem as a, a critical problem, as a crisis problem, and see if that can get people uh, were more involved. My understanding, certainly in the NPO community in South Africa, is if you talk to the right people in different organizations, you're able to form some form of community. And then if that fails, one of the things that works very well is to get a really prominent person to make the call. So when I want to get people together around education and poverty, I say, Tuli, would you mind? <laughs> calling these five people and she would do it eh? I mean she's amazing she would actually do it and who can deny <laughs> to live you know and so it's finding a a you know there's, there's a word for this in the development literature but somebody who has the ability to call together important people and have them work together and she is amazing in that sense and then, and we need those leaders to then show up with a spirit of generosity. So yeah, thank yeah. you, Professor, for modeling that for us. So I want to now open the mic if anybody wanted to um, articulate some thoughts, um, ask a final question. We've got 10 minutes left. You literally can just unmute yourself and I will see that you're unmuted and then we will give you the opportunity to speak. So please don't hold back now, guys. This is your opportunity. Uh, Professor said there's a time to speak and a time to be quiet. This is your opportunity to unmute your mic and 
clear a thought or a response or a question. And if you don't do that, I might uh, have to. I have to say, I have to say that the the comments in the chat box are, are, are a bit overwhelming. Um, so thank you very very much. Um, uh, <laughs> on a light. On a, lighter, on a lighter note, you know, one of the few advantages of being black is you can't blush. Well, I just want to say that it, it sounds to me as if my dream might be might be coming true with, with Mary saying she might invite us to come and do a session at Salzburg. Yeah. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, so people are sharing beautiful comments. I just want to, I'm not seeing anybody being willing to speak up. I may have to call on you. Grant Kelly, you are being asked to say something. Mel Tomlinson, Ben Kurisang, if you're still here. No, ben has had to leave, unfortunately. Uh, Grant, and then Susanna. And yeah, Th Thanks, Louise. Yeah, I suppose from my side, I'd just like to uh, thank the prof. I've, uh, I've listened to many of these um, sessions that you've had uh, and I've taken, you know, a lot of a, a lot of things out of. Oh my goodness, Grant. And 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 I suppose I'm I'm really inspired by your message, your courage, your um, uh, your humility, and uh, you know the the way you take a stand for what's right in society and. Yeah, it, it, I suppose it inspires all of us to, to be a be the better version of ourselves. And thanks for your courage in, in, in taking that position and, and fulfilling that role for us. Thanks very much, Grant. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Prof, I have been in a few conversations with Grant mm -hmm. where he's about being in a room with you. So, so I know that this is part of what he wants to do. Uh, Tazama, <clears throat> we'd love to hear from you. Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Jensen. Uh, I'm Chozama. I'm in the Free State, your favorite province. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I work as a regional director for South African Revenue Service. Um, I just want to find out, uh, Prof, and thanks for your insights and, and you being humble uh, since I've known you. I just want to find out your thinking of the current state of leadership. Uh, yes, it may be political, but what we see is something that is making us so afraid to see our children looking and listening to what is happening in all the political parties that is creating some ethical ethical uh, 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 solution that no one wants to see in future. What is your thought about the current state of leadership, not only of the uh, ruling party, but generally uh, mm. for our future? Thank you. No, Tazana, you know, you, uh, and, and welcome to the peace state. I, I, I miss I miss being there. Um, I just need to say that your point is correct. This isn't just about the ruling party. This is about all, I mean, you look at the qualification scandal in the, in the DA. We can do better than that. If you look at the infighting within the ruling party, we can do much better than that. If you look at the sort of manly violence within the EFF, we can do better than that. And as you said, because of social media and because of, you know, the, the filming of parliamentary uh, sessions, uh, I mean, I said to a group that came to visit me from the, one of the parliamentary portfolio committees, I said, I just want to tell you, I respect you. You are the elected leaders of our people, but you are no example to my students at, at all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they, they just hung their heads and it's true. So young people see this behavior and they think it's normative. And so it's not very really encouraging. There are, on the other hand, encouraging signs. I'm really, really uh, hopeful that President Ramaphosa succeeds because he really is trying. I think he's taken huge risk. It's taken a while, um, but I, I know there's calculations that must be made. And I think we need to support him in order to just establish some basis for dealing with corrupt individuals, you know, wherever they might be from. Thank you so much. Sure. And um, we need SARS to function as well, Tazama. So please don't, Indeed. you know, step up and lead. <laughs> we, we that, that, Louise, is the commitment that we have made. And that commitment that we have made uh, in support of our commissioner, Professor Edward Kisbecher, that resulted in SARS achieving and exceeding 
the set target by the current minister. And we are not going anywhere backwards. All that we want is to deliver and for our society to grow. And I can assure you, it is because of leaders like Professor Janssen that we are so proud and willing to learn and join these conversations because no one can say is perfect. There is time every time to learn and grow if you are a leader. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you, Thank Professor. Thank you, Salma. Thanks, I think you've given us your next, we've, you've, given, you've reminded us that Edward should be on our list of, of um, leaders to interview as part of our leading in crisis um, series because he has definitely been in the eye of the storm. So on that note, I want to say thank you very much to everybody. Uh, Tasneem has posted a link to the to the uh, feedback form. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your responses. If you've got any thoughts for us around who should we invite as um, the next speaker in our series, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And please stay in touch. And please go and be the leader that you have been called to be. And Prof, you've got the last word, final words of inspiration for all of us. Well, no, just to say, you know, uh, sometimes one gets despondent. And when I listen to, to, to people like Grant and Tazama and others, I too am encouraged. Thank you so much to all of you for the difference you make. Often unheralded, but uh, thank you. And Louise, thank you once again for your amazing leadership. Uh, please never leave this country. We will all... <laughs> We will all sink in, in the, into depression, but thank you for your practical uh, uh, leadership in our country at this time. Mutual, as, as mutual appreciation. So on that note, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Prof, for making time for us. Uh, let's go and be the leaders we've been called to be. If not us, then who? Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Louise. Bye. Bye-bye.